Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Tom Holman. I'm with the Bloomington Housing Authority. I've been with them for years. Um, and uh, we try and do a little bit of community outreach by putting on seminars. We have seminars on Thursday evenings during the summer, the third Thursday of the month, dealing with home improvement issues. Um, I ran into Bob Dom at a seminar he put on at, in South Minneapolis called, uh, it was at a place called uh, Natural Built Home. And I thought that he would be a good uh, resource to put on a seminar on organic lawn care. Uh, Bob grew up on a farm in Iowa, has his own landscaping business, and uh, is kind of an interesting character. He goes by the nickname of Organic Bob. Bob, take it away. Thank All you. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, like he said, I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and uh, my mom was a, a school teacher, and she also taught uh, soil conservation to farmers and pretty much anybody who would listen. <laughs> and, and so, I'd, you know, it's kind of the blending of, of both my, my dad as a farmer and my mom as an educator that brings me here today, and, um, and I... Also, the fact that I, I watched my dad and my, my grandfather die of cancer, and all their farmer buddies die of cancer one after the other over the years. And the prostate cancer rate for my home county in Iowa used to be 18 times the national average. And I think it's since dropped, but it's been mainly because of all these old farmers died. And, you know, it's these ag chemicals that are, I feel, are what is responsible, at least in part. And, uh, and I remember my, my grandfather telling my dad, you know, don't use the fertilizer that you would buy in town. It, you have to put more on in every year to get the same yield. It kills something in the soil. And it, he's right. And, you know, and this was a guy with... You know, I don't think he even had a high school education, but he knew from his own experiences what was going on. And then years after that, I was in charge of grounds for a children's psychiatric hospital. And uh, the, their playground just looked terrible because I, I was refusing to do any chemicals on it. And we started doing organic methods and products in there. And it was a lot of work at first, but after three years, the playground looked better than the rest of the grounds that we were doing with conventional chemicals. And we were spending less time and labor in there doing that. And what, what I learned from that was the soil is even more alive than I had thought it was up until then. And well, that's kind of the crux of organic lawn care as I approach it, it's about the soil microbiology. And with that, we'll get going. If you have any questions at any time, you know, shout them out. Uh, it's, we're real informal here. So this is the soil structure. And it, it makes up 95% of, of soil. And it's basically different sizes and pieces of, of stone. And you got gravel and sand, silt, and clay. And clay is usually a, a flat particles that cling together, and they have an ion charge, so it's like two pieces of buttered bread, you know, they're kind of stuck together. And that's why it's, it just forms an impermeable barrier, and it retains that much moisture. So and that 
if you have all clay, it stops the soil from percolating, from allowing the moisture to go through. And here, um, we've got, you know, the bare rock. This is the planet Earth billions of years ago. And Mother Nature is always trying to head towards these, these climax communities where, you know, you've got uh, like a tropical rainforest or a, uh, an oak savanna and things like this. And, and in this, whoops, in this succession, you, you start out with bare rock and then you get these lichens and mosses and herbs and weeds, a pioneer species that they grow up real fast and then they die back. And they're there to take care of the soil problems that interfere with the succession in, <laughs> I'll figure this out yet, into the, you know, this stage, the intermediate stage. And most of our lawns are stuck right here in the weed stage. And what we try to do with, by shifting the soil microbiology, you know, because it changes at every stage, we're going to just jump over that, that part. And we'll skip the weeds, you know, been there, done that. Now we'll move on to the grassland, which is where we want our lawns to be. And the way we do it is with the soil food web. You know, you, you remember hearing about the food chain, you know, the deer eats the grass and the wolf eats the deer and all this. Well, there's that and more going on in the soil and it, it all starts with organic matter and then bacteria and fungi break that down and something eats them and something eats them and it's just amazing the stuff that goes on down there. And here's a great example of the interactions of these species. The white area here is a plant root. This is an electron microscope photograph and it's greatly, you know, magnified. But this is the, that whole area in there is a root. And this guy is a root feeding nematode. He takes this spike here and he jabs it in and he feeds off the plant, the roots. And it's like a mosquito. And he can carry diseases or that open wound then can let diseases in. And these things, these rope-like things, that's a strand of um, fungi, like when you open, you kick over a log in the woods and it's got that white stuff in there. That's what those are, strands of that. And they are, <laughs> they are attached onto this root because they, they have this symbiotic relationship with the plant. And the, they, the plant puts carbohydrates in the soil, and that's what these, these fungi feed on. And they can tell by what they're getting. It's like, oh, your, your carbohydrates taste funky today. I'm, I'm going to go get some calcium, and I'll bring it back to you with water. So they become a root extension. But in this setting, they, there's so many of them around this root, this, this bad guy gets tangled up in there, and he, he dies and ends up becoming food for the plant. So these are just three species here. And we're talking about thousands of species and how they interact with each other in the soil. And it's, I get all geeked out about it, so <laughs> bear with me. But it, it's truly amazing. And this is the secret of organic lawn care. So now we're going to look at grass. And what is the best habitat for lawn grass? Um, what is its native habitat? It's, its light and moisture needs. So Kentucky bluegrass originated in northern Asia. It's, it's not American. It's been Americanized, but it's, it's not native. And most of the grass species in our lawns, well, all of them, um, are not native to this continent. And they come from climates where they, they get you know, a lot of sun 
and they don't get as hot or cold as we get, and they get about twice the amount of rain. So think England. And then compare it to, well, the last few days it's been like that, but you know, we're pretty hot and dry compared to, to that climate. And the four hours of sun, that's how much sun shade grass the stuff that's sold as shade grass needs in order to be thick and healthy enough to keep out weeds. So it should be called shade tolerant grass. And to illustrate the point, I can tolerate being underwater. I don't thrive there. And the grass, shade grass, can tolerate shade, but it doesn't like it. It likes sun. And then the watering, an inch, the equivalent of an inch of rain a week to keep your lawn hydrated and to really take care of that, um, that grass. That's what its needs are. You know, you've got house plants that some of them need more water than others, and you don't just let those, you know, fend for themselves. You give them what they need. And in order to have a thick and healthy lawn that will keep weeds out, it needs that supplemental water in this climate. Not this week, <laughs> with all the rain we've been getting. Yeah. How, how does that work? I mean, we've got probably some couple of inches of nice black dirt on top of a base of clay. So does this change depending on if you have clay there or sand or what? Yeah, and the. The problem with the clay is, like we were talking about, it just really holds the moisture. And it, um, there's probably a, a compacted layer in there also. So clay in and of itself will drain. You know, these were all native clay soils throughout the metro prim primarily. And, you know, but before settlement, you know, before the white man came and did their thing, it would infiltrate. And it was because it had the roots and the living microbes going through and tunneling through, and that clay would um, hold, they would form tunnels in it. And then they, there's chemical processes that, that called flocculation. It sounds naughty, but it's not. And it's where they just kind of clump the clay together. And the when I see a lot of clay in a lawn or a lot of sand, the solution is the same. Incorporate organic matter and, you know, and that will have the, the microbes in it. So, and one of the best things you can do for your lawn um, is to top dress with a good quality compost, you know, maybe once a year in the fall. If you got the energy, you can do it in the spring too. But it, did that answer your question? Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough situation because, yeah. And do you have a lot of dandelions? Yeah, they love a compacted clay soil. They've got that long taproot that'll break through and so, and, and there, you know, when, on any lawn, if you're watering it and you see it start to run off, you know, stop and, let it soak in, and then do it again after a while. Okay, what issues do, do our lawns have? Uh, weeds, we'll talk about the four-step test, and steep slopes, wet areas, and uneven, bumpy surfaces. And you guys got a steep slope? Bumpy surface, bumpy surface yeah. I see that a lot. and. Um, We'll get to it. So weeds. How many people have creeping Charlie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous. You know, it was, it was brought here from England as a, a ground cover, and it it escaped. And so it's it's a it's a tough one to get rid of with herbicide. I mean, it's just a really persistent plant, but it. It usually starts on bare soil in the shade, and they, um, it's a sign of a pH imbalance either way. 
you know, either acidic or um, alkaline. And it's... What is the pH of the soil? For a lawn, it should be like 6.5. You know, just right around neutral. And what gets bad? What's the bad side of that? Seven? Uh, seven's neutral, so, you know, bad side. I've seen Creeping Charlie, you know, way down on either side. Uh, no, typically, it, it, you know, the, well, the, yeah, that'd be way acidic. And, uh, you know, and the question was, what, what is the pH for lawn? Um, and I've seen pHs anywhere from, you know, like five and a half up to eight. And I used to test every lawn, and then I realized I could just tell what was going on in the soil by the, by the plants that were there, the weeds that were there. Um, and, you know, I've, I've seen Creeping Charlie in balanced pH soils, but that tells me then there's a calcium deficiency there. So it can tolerate stuff, but it really thrives at like five and a half to six and the same on the other side of the scale. So. And clover, uh, they used to sow clover into lawns uh, because it would be the only green thing in the lawn this time of year. And they knew that it, it pulled nitrogen from the air and put it in the soil and it would help feed the grass. And so with that, you know, if I see a lot of clover in the lawn, it tells me that there's a nitrogen deficiency in that soil. And, and it's a good companion plant. Um, I've sown lawns out of just clover and skipped the grass. Uh, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's actually softer than grass. And you don't have to mow it. You know, you can if you want, but it's, you know, and then when you get weeds in that, it, you notice those too. So it's, you know, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then you be pulling the grass out. So, and dandelion, it's got that tap root. Its ecological job is to break through that compaction and to pull trace minerals from deep in the soil and redeposit them on top. And if you, your soil, the clay soil, if you give the dandelions 10,000 years, they'll change the chemical composition of that soil and the structure of that soil. But most of us don't have that kind of a timeline, so we, we've got other methods. A four-step assessment, and what I do when I go to a lawn and assess it is I'll, I'll walk through and take 10 steps and you count the number of times you step on weeds. And if it's four or more, you're better off replacing the lawn, uh, you know, tearing it out and correcting the soil problems, adding organic matter, and then uh, laying sod or seeding. And so I mean, there's a lot of lawns. Yes? So the question was, can you treat the soil with the plants that grow quick and die? Yeah, yeah and that basically those are, are the weeds. Okay. Are they adding things to the soil? Yeah, they'll change it uh, if there's clover in there. Yeah. And yeah, the, the weeds are the quick growing. You know, their life cycle dandelions are biennial, crabgrass is an annual. You know, so they, a lot of them, uh, Creeping Charlie is a perennial, <laughs> but it, you know, it spreads by runner and by seed. So, you know, it, there's tipping points. You know, once it gets going, it's tough to stop it. You have to take drastic measures to stop it. Um, and if, if there are a lot of weeds, you know, it, I would say that, 90% of weeds are caused by compacted soil. And the compacted soil is caused by the construction that went on, but also by the 
when the living microorganisms die off and the tunnels that they used to run through collapse. And so then that soil just becomes hard as a rock and roots can't penetrate it. And sometimes when, if it's underground, this layer of compaction, the water will f filter down and then it stops there and it, it actually will pool underground and cause anaerobic uh, soil conditions. Um, and they, they create this bile slime uh, that coats the roots of the grass and other plants and kind of smothers them. And there's some weeds that love those conditions. Uh, and this water, when it, when it pools, it can turn into a raw form of alcohol or formaldehyde. And broadleaf plantain is one of the plants that love those conditions. I, I call it the drunk of the plant world because it's, you know, if there's alcohol underground, you'll see that. And it's a good indicator plant. How does, where does this water pool? Does it lie? Uh, the water will pool below ground because of, there's a, a layer that's so compacted, the water can't infiltrate. And what makes it more compacted? I mean, just the roots have gotten some of it softer, but, or more porous, but they didn't get that far? Is that what? No, the, they can't go through it. It's almost like it's stone to them. So, you know, like this building, you know, we've got beautiful green grass out here. It's probably being watered, you know, with an irrigation system and managed chemically. And so, you know, when they were building this, there were bulldozers and you know, all kinds of heavy equipment going over and that compacted the soil and synthetic fertilizers uh, will kill off microbes and um, pesticides, herbicides, those will kill off microbes. And so, you know, there's fewer and fewer microbes running through and maintaining these little, you know, tunnels through the soil. And so they collapse. And that causes, you know, that's a form of compaction. And then the roots can't go in. And I've seen I've got a book called Roots Demystified, and, <laughs> and it, but it's interesting because they'll talk about compaction layers and they show where the roots go down and they hit something and then they're going like this and looking for a way down. And, you know, and they find it, they'll, you know, they exploit that access, but if I've seen it where we're digging in a yard and you hit this hard area and and you do a cross section and you see roots piling up underground there. And the more roots there, you know, the, the more water will get there. And then the more um, bio slime will form on these roots. So it's, it's like us trying to walk around with tar on our skins. You know, it's, it's rough going. Steep slopes, how'd you like to mow that thing? <laughs> and, you know, if you put water on that, it's just going to shoot right off. It's a tough area to grow grass on. And if that's a south-facing slope, you can almost forget it. You know, and, and again, the goal is to have your grass be thick and healthy enough to keep out weeds. So you got wet areas, grass doesn't like that. Um, you know, and I see it more often in uh, commercial developments, you know, like uh, apartment houses where they have irrigation and they've got this weird grading going on where there will be low areas. And, you know, you see a dead area of grass and you can tell that's where water has sat long enough it smothered it. Um, uneven bumpy surface. <laughs> what happens a lot of times in lawns is that they get thin and then that erosion takes place so you end up with this unevenness um, and if there are a lot of um, earthworms too they'll contribute to that with the pile of castings. 
by their hole, and usually it's both. Um, and if you see a lot of earthworms in a lawn, it's also a sign of that uh, anaerobic soil activity because earthworms love to eat bacteria. And where you have a lot of food source, you'll have a lot of population of what eats that food source, and that's the earthworms. So, um, you know, that's a good indication. And the solution for it is to um, apply compost or even topsoil and just smooth it out and then seed that. And that'll, you know, get rid of that bumpiness or unevenness. So. It's an easy fix. This is hard work, but it's not a, real complicated. And that doesn't ruin the grass before it below it? Or? No, not if you don't put it on too thick. And I'm talking like a half inch or so at the most. And when you top dress a lawn, I, you'll hear me using that phrase a lot. And, and that, you know, is just a thin layer of compost or topsoil right on top of the grass. And um, I think I have the, the steps for that in the renovation part of the, this next section. So coming up with an action plan for your lawn, uh, reduce the size of the lawn, uh, whether you should replace it or renovate it, and then how to maintain it. And to reduce it, you want to define the lawn purpose and size. You know, just because you've always had grass there doesn't mean you, always, you have to. Um, and put the grass where it's going to do good, where it will stay thick and healthy enough, keep out weeds. And if you have an area where it's really problematic, you know, change it. Get rid of the grass and put something else in. Uh, consider edible landscaping. Um, I do a lot of that, and people, you know, would much rather have a berry patch in that shady area of the lawn rather than trying to get that lawn to grow. Um, and you can create outdoor rooms, and we'll go into a lawn purpose. You know, you've got uh, a commercial setting here, and so they're. Their purpose for the lawn, they need the big expanses. Um, here, you got the family with a little kids. You want room for them to play. And so there's two different purposes there for the lawn, and, and that can change where you have your lawn. So garden, if you have a steep slope, put a garden in, like these people did. I wouldn't even want to take care of that. But what do you do? It's better than grass. Um, and a garden in the shade. You know, if you get deep shade, grass is never going to do very well there. So take it out, put stuff in that likes those conditions. And you can make some really gorgeous shade gardens. Um, and edible landscapes, um, you know, here it's. It's called an herb spiral, and you just, they, basically it's a mound of dirt with this stone going up, and you create microclimates, like on this side it's more shaded, and so that's where you plant cilantro and other things that will be less likely to bolt um, and turn bitter, so the, the stuff that likes less light would go over here, and then stuff that likes it hot and dry over there and then in between. So outdoor rooms, that reduces the patio or reduces the grass and creates a nice area. Um, I had clients call me and they, they wanted an assessment of their lawn and they had a big lawn in St. Louis Park and it was almost all creeping Charlie. And it was, and they had some nice garden beds and then this big area of lawn. And I said, well, you know, it looks like you like to garden. Why don't you just get rid of the grass? And you have a room up on top here where 
you have the picnic table and stuff like that. And then instead of this big lawn area, come on in. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, the big lawn area coming down the hill and just make that a path instead of, you know, a, an expanse of lawn. And then a lower area where they um, also did family activities. So they've got a, a path of lawn and they got rid of about 4,000 square feet of lawn and the gardens are a lot lower maintenance than that grass would be. So what? Wood fires? Wood fires? Yeah. yeah, it does cause a lot of air pollution. I, you know, I, I love a, a good bonfire, but when I'm in my apartment and the neighbors are doing it and it's coming right in my window, it, it really bites. So, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, replacing lawns, you can do a sod or seed it, and this is a method of hydro seeding, it's called. Um, and there again, you do that four step thing. And if, if you've got a lot of weeds, you're better off just starting over. And, you know, what we, what we do is we'll, we go in and we, we remove the existing turf or weeds and send it to a compost site. And then we, uh, we put a couple inches of compost on top and till it in and then start a fertilizer and then we lay sod on it. And, uh, and we'll apply compost tea, which I'll get to in a minute. But the, the root system of that grass, it's not at all uncommon for me to get it like eight inches deep. And the industry goal is to get it three inches deep. And with organic, you can surpass that easily. So, and the deeper the root structure, the more moisture that soil can hold. So instead of a, a three inch aquifer, you got an eight inch or 12, you've just increased the, the soil water holding capacity. You know, you've, you've about tripled it or quadrupled it. So it's, it's gonna be less dependent on that watering because it's gonna have a better reserve right there. Um, and renovate. Um, this is, you know, if you're if you got a few weeds and your lawn's just kind of scraggly or looks a little anemic, um, you can top dress with compost, peat moss, or topsoil. And top dress again is just that a quarter of an inch to half an inch thick layer right on top. And what I do is I will mow the lawn fairly short and you can leave the clippings lay and then we spread the compost on top of that and rake out any spots where it's too thick you know where it would smother the grass and then uh, put down a oops put down a starter fertilizer and then a good grass seed blend and you can aerate it. You don't have to do that step. Yeah. So, so when you're top dressed, you just throw it out to the shovel? Yeah, the question is... Uh, uh, you know, lawn spreader or something? You know, the question is, um, when you top dress, you just throw it out with shovels or do you use a spreader? And there's no spreader on the market that is affordable for homeowners to spread that. Um, they're like 800 to 1,000 bucks for a manual one. Um, and so, yeah, and we do it. You know, we'll load a bunch of the compost up in a wheelbarrow and we take a, a grain scoop and fill it up and just go out and shake it around on the lawn. And you, know, you don't have to have that quarter inch uniform, but you know, that's the goal you shoot for. And the, the aeration, um, I, you know, it's, it's nice in that it pulls the cores out and it opens the soil up so the, the compost and the fertilizer and seed will all flow into that, um, you know, with rain and watering. And, but it's, it's a 350 pound machine 
that's supposed to relieve compaction. I mean, you know, give me a break. <laughs> and about the only thing it compacts is my spine when I try to use it. But, but how else are you supposed to sort of break up like, a, like for us, a heavy clay slide? It's the microbes will do a far better job. Yeah, and the, the compaction at best, it gets in three inches. You know, and they actually will tell you water before you do that, so you get better cores pulled out. But when you're rolling that thing over wet soil, you're just compacting it more. So it's just intuitively, it's, it's something I try to stay away from. And plus they're just, they're, they're brutal. <laughs> If somebody else is doing it, I'll do it. I, I ran with a quick one about four years ran it. Yeah. It's, it's impossible, hard to drive. Yeah. To handle. Yeah. And if you hit a hard area, it's like you're flying along behind it. It's, it's a real party. And the compost tea, and the compost tea uh, is something you make. And uh, it should be called aerated compost tea because that's what I'm, what I'm talking about. There's uh, compost tea where you take compost, put it in a burlap bag and stick it in water and just let it steep like tea. But what we're talking about doing um, is taking good quality compost, put it in water that's been bubbled you know, aggressively aerated and so that the chlorine has been gassed off and then the, the tea or the compost is added and basically what you're doing is you're stripping the, the microorganisms out of that compost and then, then you add some food for those microorganisms and you propagate them so that, you know, their populations just skyrocket and then you, you take that and dilute it with some water that's been aerated. And uh, because we're aerating it, we're only propagating the organisms that are aerobic and not the anaerobic organisms like E. coli and Listeria. So it's, you know, it's, it's safe. Those organisms are suppressed and the good guys that will take care of the soil problems will be in this in this tea and then you go and apply it as a foliar on the surface of the the leaf and then as a soil drench too and you can do it on trees shrubs perennials lawns uh, veggie gardens at time of planting I wouldn't do it on the veggies themselves um, you know, because it is a, a compost product, there could be some E. coli in it. Um, it's better safe than sorry. But then you're setting up this healthy soil food web, and it, it goes a long ways towards shortening the amount of time it takes to get a lawn from weeds with chemicals to just thick, healthy lawn that can almost take care of itself. Uh, you had said you put some <clears throat> food into the compost that has been put into aerated water. What type of food are you talking about? Okay, the question is um, what, what food are we talking about when we talk about the food that you put in to make compost tea? And uh, different foods will propagate different organisms. Uh, for lawns, you want to propagate uh, the bacteria in this mix. And uh, so they'll put molasses in. But the, the one that I use is, it's got bone meal, feather meal, I think maybe blood meal. But it, they're basically fertilizers, organic fertilizers but we put them in in small amounts. So it's nutritional value to plants is 
pretty marginal, but the, the microbial content is huge. And um, the feather meal will help promote the, the fungi and other things promote, uh, like if you want, um, what was it, protozoa for a certain, you know, purpose, then you put straw in and it'll propagate that. Uh, there's certain soil conditions that call for that. And, but for the most part, for a general purpose, um, I use a, a, a compost um, prepackaged and it has the food in with it and a packet with it. And it, it's great, you just throw it in and you don't have to you know, worry about having it tested because you're using somebody else's recipe where it has been tested. And if you do things the way they tell you to, then you get you know, the results that, that are consistent with their, their products. Um, there are uh, compost tea brewers you can buy and suppliers and you can also go online and find out um, I, I have one client who's made his own using an aquarium stone and he's following the program that I've outlined and his lawn looks great and he's doing it all himself so it's you know you, you can do it it's a lot of work on the front end but it can be done Renovation, uh, build a lawn. The renovation you want to do in late April, early May, or later in August or early September. Um, and the, the, of those two, the best time is uh, late August, early September. That's a natural life cycle of the grass plant. It, it forms uh, seed heads and then they drop the seeds and they'll start germinating here in, in about a month. And that's also when you'll see sod farms seeding is in late August. And um, sod, you can do that anytime from mid-April through early November. It, you know, if you do it this time of year, you're gonna end up watering a lot more than if you did it later in the year but it can be done any time and seed is best done late August or early September. And weed control, if you, you know, you get weeds, it's hard to wait for mother nature to take its course and, you know, build up the grass to, to crowd the weeds out. Um, so with this one, with the, you know, spraying weeds with an organic weed killer, there isn't one on the market that won't also kill the grass. So if you see one in a garden store or something, it's, it's gonna be non-selective, meaning that it kills everything. So, and you can still use it in lawns, but you gotta be really careful. Otherwise you end up with a bunch of dead patches of, of dead grass. And, and a lot of times you gotta treat the weeds two or three times, so you, you'll have a dead patch of grass with the weed in the middle of it. And um, so, you know, it's, it's not at all uh, like the chemical regimens where if you have this weed, you need this chemical. It's more, if you have this weed, you need to add organic matter and increase the microbial life in the soil. If you have this other weed, you need to add organic matter. You know, the solution is the same, no matter what. But what's in the uh, organic one that's non-selective and kills everything? Uh, the active ingredient is vinegar. And it's a strong solution of vinegar. Uh, the stuff you buy in the store is like 5%. And then pickling vinegar is about 11 or 12%. And we're talking horticultural vinegar, which is 15 to 20. And they, they also have some other stuff. There's usually clove oil and other things that 
enhance the performance of it. Um, yeah, this is, oops, this is uh, my personal favorite. <laughs> and you can do it in lawn too, but it's, you know, fire is also non-selective. It kills everything it touches, including houses and garages, so you got to be careful. But it, it's very effective. It kills them both. Yeah. What you want to do is you want to, um, you want to wilt the leaves. Think maim rather than amputate. So, you know, the, the, the weeds, if their leaves are damaged, they'll try to regenerate those leaves and expend their energy on it and then die out. And it, it may take a couple times for some weeds, but I had a client who his backyard was almost solid creeping Charlie, and he would come home at night and he'd, he'd burn a 10 square foot area and put compost on there and grass seed, and the next night he'd come home and if it was a tough day at work, he'd burn a 15 square foot area. And, you know, and at the end of the summer, he had this weird quilt patchwork looking backyard but the end of the next summer, it looked gorgeous, and he didn't have any creeping Charlie. And he got rid of it all with, with the organic matter and fire. <laughs> so, and you can buy those, um, these little uh, burners at um, Northern Tool and Equipment and uh, Mills Fleet Farm. A lot of garden centers are carrying them now, too. And I have a friend who's a organic farmer in Iowa and he has a flame cultivator where he goes down the rows and there's big flames that shoot out and kill the weeds. And Is that a weed Yeah, some, any kind of a mechanical, you know, weed popper, weed hound, uh, those, they work pretty well for popping weeds out. And here we have some kids that are just running out, they're so excited they get to pull weeds in the yard. <laughs> so. I was told for dandelions that weed, whatever, I can't remember, is that the right name, was the best way to get them out because I've been hand pulling them and I, they break off so then they, I accomplish nothing. Yeah, and if you can go out when the soil's really moist, um, you know, even hand weeding, it's easier to get the results. You get that enough of that taproot where it, it doesn't come back. And here's the monthly program. Um, in April you do corn gluten meal and that's available at most garden centers. Um, and it's, it will keep weed seeds from germinating. It also keeps grass seed from germinating so you have to be careful, you know, if you're planning on reseeding an area, don't put corn gluten meal on it, you know, before you seed. And it's effective for six weeks after application. Um, the spring one is done for crabgrass control. And it, uh, crabgrass, how many people have crabgrass in their lawn? Yeah, a little more than half. So. Crabgrass is an annual. It comes from a seed every year. And you usually will see it next to the curb um, or a driveway and, or the boulevard where the salt and sand gets up there. And it loves those conditions. It likes it hot, dry, sandy, and a little bit alkaline, which the, the salt will do. And one seed can remain viable for up to 150 years. So we got that going for us. The good news is, is that it doesn't like fertilizing or watering. So if you're taking care of the lawn, you'll push back that, that crabgrass. Um, then in May and June, we do compost tea and organic fertilizer. Uh, in July, you can do a soil activator. It's an actual product by Fertilome, and a lot of hardware stores carry that brand. 
Um, and it, it's cheap, it's good to use, it's a low grade coal. It comes from the bottom of peat bogs and it's, it's great. You put it on in July and a week later your lawn is greener. It really improves the hydration of the grass. Fertilome, F-E-R-T-I-L-O-M-E. -E. Is that a top dressing of them? Do you need that just spread it over the top of the lawn? Yeah, the, you put it down with a spreader. Yeah, I'm, all of these are, you can put down with a, a typical lawn spreader with the exception of the compost tea. And, and do you have instructions as to how much, many pounds you put down? Uh, the, com the corn gluten meal, you want to put down 20 pounds per thousand square feet. And the fertilizer and the soil activator will have the directions on the bag. And as far as brands, I wonder if I have a slide. Nope. Uh, the brands I like, uh, Renaissance, which is a local one, Ringer. Um, Plant Healthcare is a really good brand, and that uh, Ringer and Plant Healthcare are available at Clears Nursery, and that's K L I E R S. They're at 59th and Nicollet, and it's it's kind of spendy. It's 50 pounds for 50 bucks. But it goes a long ways, and and it's good, and it's it's got the the root bacteria that's good for grass and other plants, and it's good stuff. And then September and October again, you do the compost tea and fertilizer. And did everybody get all that written down? Okay. Uh, a grass garden, it's basically, you know, what a lawn is. Everything you do to another kind of a garden, you do to grass. You water it, you mulch it, you fertilize it, you weed it. It's, it's the same thing. And the watering of an inch a week, uh, you mow it three inches or higher. And the reason is the, the grass plant the blade of the grass, the leaf surface, that's what it eats with. That's the, what drives the photosynthesis. So if that's short, the plant feels threatened and it puts all of its growth energy into growing that. And if it's three inches, it seems to relax a little bit and says, I can deal with that. And so it puts more energy into developing roots. And the, the other thing that it accomplishes is it, it shades the ground so you get less moisture loss and seeds won't germinate because they're, they're in the shade. So that's one of the best controls for crabgrass that we have. And mulch your grass clippings, um, you know, unless they're, your lawn is so thick and and sometimes in the spring it is where they clump up and they'll cause dead spots. So, But if you can, mulch your grass clippings and keep the mower blade sharp. Um, I like to, you know, depending on the size of the lawn, if you have any size of lawn, you sharpen it in the spring and maybe once halfway through the year. But you keep it sharp, otherwise you get ragged edges that don't heal and then diseases can get in. Or, and it just dries out the, the grass. Uh, and then follow an organic program like we just, just had up here before this. And this is my daughter and her dog and cat. And, you know, we, we can live with this. I can let her go out and play on the yard. And, and she knows that if she lets her dog Morgan out there, Morgan's not going to be running through anything. And she says the cat doesn't care. So, <laughs> but you know, we're talking about you know 
the health of plants and the, the ecosystem and our kids and ourselves. And it's, if there's a few weeds in your lawn, let them be. Oh. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what about debatching and what about uh, mowing your lawns, mulching those? The uh, leaves in the fall and leaving those on the grass as well. Okay, the question was what about uh, dethatching and mulching leaves in the fall? Uh, dethatching, don't ever do it. It's uh, most of the time what people are trying to get up isn't thatch, it's just old clippings. If it's white looking, it's grass clippings and they'll break down in an organic program. If it's a thick layer that looks like a brown Brillo pad, uh, that's thatch and that's roots and runners that are on top of the ground and it's because the roots can't penetrate or because they're being watered like daily so they don't have, they don't have to work for the water and, and in an organic program that will be gone within a year. So, and the, the dethatching machine, um, it, it really damages the existing grass because it cuts right into the crown. You know, it's like I can use a haircut if it's going this way. If it's going this way, you know, vertically, it's gonna, it's gonna draw some blood. So, don't do it. And, who else had a question? The leaves. Oh, the leaves. Yeah, the leaves. Uh, you can shred up some of those and you know mulch them in place, but it it will be a lot for you know if it, again if it's going to smother the grass, you know don't do it. And but otherwise, yeah, it's a good mulch. What about composting it? I mean, composting the leaves and using it next year. Yeah, that's great. If you can compost your the leaves from your yard and then spread them back over the lawn, it's it's great. Leaf compost is really good, and it doesn't have uh, um, weed seeds in it. And and if you're if you're wondering about a compost and if it's good to use on a lawn or not get a sample of it if you can and put it in a pot and water it and see what grows. And if it's just solid, you know, green stuff, don't use it because it will, you'll be inoculating your lawn with all kinds of weed seeds. But if you get a few, you know, in there, it's okay. It'd be good to use. And it, it's going to vary from one to the other. What if you don't want to use water? If you don't want to use water. It's not to be wasting a lot of water. Yeah. yeah. If your goal is to not waste a lot of water, a lawn really isn't the right plant. It's just r very water dependent. Um, unless you, you're okay with having weeds. Because again, in order for that grass to be thick and healthy enough to keep weeds out, it needs a lot of water. Um, and there are a lot of alternatives. You know, you can shrink down the size of that, that lawn and do other plantings. You know, and the, the more native plants you can put in, the better because they, they like our climate. Grass doesn't like it. You know, it's like it would rather be back in England. And, but if you can create England here, um, you know, it's, then grass will do well. And, I, you know, and I, I feel strongly about this. That the term organic lawn is almost an oxymoron because it is a high demand plant. The most organic lawn you can have is the one you tear out and put in a compost pile and plant something else in there. You know, and especially in deep shade and, and s steep slopes. And I get people, you know, 
want me to plant grass in deep shade and it you know it'll it'll come up it'll look good this year but it, it'll fall apart and next year it'll look just like it did this year before you started so you know and there's all kinds of other um, plants that will do well and you know put some food in there perennial foods like berries or asparagus uh, fruit trees they'll you know, it's about time these lawns started feeding us instead of the other way around. And Are there any plants that you can plant that will help treat the soil? Help bring the to the neutral uh, The question was, are there any plants you can plant that will help bring the pH back to neutral? And uh, there are, I don't, I know of them uh, in... I don't know if the USDA or um, the Minnesota Extension website will have, you know, if you look at plants to alter pH, um, you probably could find a list of them there. And what's, what's the goal? Are you trying to change the pH to, for grass to grow? Well, not necessarily just grass, but everything. Everything? I know when you Yeah, and um, yeah, and they're the planting uh, when you when you plant any plant, it's going to pull nutrients out of the soil, like you were saying, and so you want to put those back in. Uh, one of the best ways of doing that is composting, and then putting that compost back on the soil. Uh, in nature, it's, it's a closed loop. You, know, you go out in the woods and nobody's raking up those leaves or those pine needles, and they, they fall. You know, they pull the nutrients from the soil and the carbon from the atmosphere, and they make leaves and bark and twigs and branches out of it. And then the leaves fall, and then they break down, and so it's, you know, it's a closed loop. Nothing's being taken out, and so, um, but in a, you know, in an urban setting, we have an artificial ecology. So they, they, um, you know, we're taking stuff out. You know, we're raking the leaves up, we're bagging clippings if there's too many, and so it's hard to have those inputs go in, and if you're taking you know, apples off an apple tree, that's a nutrient that's lost in that soil. But you can supplement that, more than supplement that with, with compost. Any other questions? Just well, one of the pH, if your pH is off, it's low drive, what do you use to raise it or lower it? The question was if your pH is off, you know, too low or too high, what do you do to change it? Um, Compost is one of the biggest buffers of pH. And it's, um, depending on the, the, you know, the source material for the compost, it can have a low or high pH. Uh, if, you, if you, um, have a soil test done and the pH, you know, is on that soil test, they'll tell you how much lime or sulfur to add. But if, if you're measuring pH under a pine tree, it's gonna be acidic. And that's because pine trees make it that way. You know, they drop their needles and they make the soil acidic. Um, if you try to put something under a pine tree, like a lawn, for example, it likes it more alkaline, it, you know, it's gonna be a, a battle so you want to match the existing pH with the plants if you can. And there's plenty of plants that like it acidic. There's plenty that like it uh, alkaline. So, you know, those are design drivers, if you will, the pH. If it's really off one way or the other. And you're far better off 
going with nature than trying to impose your will on it. Um, if it's you know a, a matter of a few points, the you can add stuff. And if you're going to plant a bunch of blueberries, there you need to change the pH to be more acidic, and so you can put pine straw in, peat moss, or sulfur. And usually if I'm planting blueberries, I do all of that. So it's, I, I did a soil test a number of years ago on this lawn that we hydro seeded and it failed. And it just, you know, and the, the way it fell, the, the yellowing and stuff led me to believe it was a pH problem. So I had the pH tested and it was really, really alkaline. It was like eight point something. And they, you know, the recommendations of the amount of sulfur we need to put on that was like we'd need to buy train loads, train car loads of sulfur to put on this two acre lawn. And I told the guy, I said, you know, you don't want to change your soil that much. And that was the natural soil in that area. And so they, they just brought in a bunch of topsoil and then we reseeded it and they were fine. So, you know, if you're, if you're bound and determined to have grass in a certain area and the conditions aren't right, you either change the conditions or get a different plant. And because you fight that stuff, you're just expending a lot of money and energy on something that's going to have mediocre return. How much does the pH vary depending on where you take your samples? Let's say you don't have a pine tree here. I mean, typically here in Bloomington, um, how representative is just one sample versus compost, 10 samples a mix of when you're getting a soil test? Or? Yeah, the question is how much does the pH vary just within your own lawn? Um, and it'll, it'll vary, you know, it can vary quite a bit. Um, you know, it depends on the history of that soil. If, you know, somebody else had a pine tree in that area and, you know, or they brought soil in from a different source for this side of the yard as opposed to that side. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of factors, but typically it won't vary that much. But what the U of M has you do when you're sampling is to take it from like three or four locations around the yard so that you do get a good random sampling and you, you know, it's a statistical method of managing. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. It, it, I mean, it, you gotta just measure yeah, yeah. So just uh, when you say add compost to the soil, is, I mean, does that mean like we've gone to Bachman's and fill up our trunk or our car the commercial compost they sell? Is that what you're referring to when you say compost? Um, yeah, that, that is one source. Um, but the, there's many sources. There's the Landscape and Concrete Center, um, or actually Clears, has a really good composted dairy manure. And it, it's got a faint odor that once you spread it out, it's gone within a couple of hours. Um, and that stuff is really good. They compost it with sawdust and corn stalks, and they take it through a kind of a rigorous process of composting and I've, I've seen the bioassays of it and it's really good stuff. Um, they'll deliver it in bulk for you. I think it's like 40 or 50 bucks per cubic yard and a cubic yard will do, um, if you're top dressing a lawn, it'll do about a thousand square feet of lawn. Um, and then there's other sources. Um, the mulch store, they have a good compost. And um, the stuff from the city sites, you know, if you can go and pick it up yourself. I'm a little leery of those because they've gotten better about composting them, but they're going to have a lot of weed seed in them. Um, and then there's other bagged compost. Mississippi Topsoils is a good one that's bagged. Um, 
I'm trying to think the old, I would, before I'd use something that's bagged, I would get a bag of it and put some in a pot and water it and see what grows. Because I've, I've used some where, you know, I know the weeds were in there. Um, so again, it's just, it's only as good as the person making it. But any other questions? I can be here all day. <laughs> if I'm not doing this, I got to go plant stuff. So <laughs> it's too hot. All right. Well, thanks. Um, and if you guys ever have any questions, give me a call. Um, that's the best way to reach me. And you're great. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> I just want to give you a sideline here that uh, I saw him speak in April. He said to put some corn, corn gluten meal on my lawn when the lilacs bloom. I did. It worked beautifully. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, guys.